stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So we want you to keep eating. We know we got a little bit of a late start, so please enjoy your lunch while we're kind of going through and talking about all that we're going to be talking about. Um, first of all, um, we have a bunch of different sponsors that we'll be telling you about specifically. So I want to just in general thank all of you who have been a sponsor for us, not only in the past but also for today. And more specifically, our title sponsor is Cox Communications, and they're also responsible for some of the filming that we're doing here today. So please give them a big round of applause. It's an awesome thing. And next, I'd like to bring up Kirsten McLaughlin. She is Cox Communications Market VP for Santa Barbara. And uh, please tell us a little bit about what's going on at Cox. Thank you. That's right. I, this is always a high one, Joyce. I feel like I have to stand on my tippy toes. Not so much for the mic, but this podium. It's all good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. I always love this event. The Carpentry Estate of the Community is such a great event in such a great space. Love the Rincon Beach Club. Thank you for hosting us once again. As you all know, Cox Communications is deeply committed to serving and supporting Carpinteria, and we're so proud to be here today. Our company's founder, James M. Cox, who grew up on a farm and became a school teacher, a newspaper man, the governor of Ohio, and even ran for president with FDR as his running mate, once said, ask yourself one question, is it right? Then do what you believe is right for your town, your state, and your company. As a family-owned and operated business, those words and our founder's legacy of civic duty continue to be at the core of our values, values that our employees live and breathe every day, especially in challenging times, like our recent Thomas Fire and Montecito debris flow. I couldn't be more proud of our local team, some of whom are here today. The work they did to restore service and support the community when faced with unimaginable challenges was truly heroic. Some of you have heard me talk about using duct tape and chicken wire to restore services to your homes and businesses in the wake of the devastating debris flow. And while it wasn't quite, that isn't quite accurate, it wasn't quite that bad, the creativity and ingenuity from our team as they cobbled together a temporary solution was just extraordinary. And in the months since, our teams have spent countless hours rebuilding our permanent network and exploring options for adding further redundancy and fortification in anticipation of whatever Mother Nature may throw at us in the future. Cox is dedicated to investing in our network and our communities throughout the Santa Barbara market, including, of course, Carpinteria, where many of our customers' employees live and work. We're in the planning and permitting stages right now to upgrade our technical facilities out at our Goleta campus, upgrades which will enhance our existing network power the community for decades to come, and enable the smart homes, smart businesses, and smart cities of today and the future. Carpinteria has been through so much over the past few months, and as we all continue to recover from fire and debris, and debris flow, I speak for all of us at Cox when we say we are honored and humble to work with so many of you who are here today to collectively rebuild and move our community forward. Thank you for all you're doing for Carpinteria and the greater Santa Barbara area. And one quick reminder before I wrap up, as Roland mentioned, we're filming today, and you'll be able to watch uh, the State of the City on the Carpinteria Channel 21 uh, in a couple weeks. Check your lo local listings. Thank you all for being here today, and a big thank you to today's sponsors. Uh, I mean, the sponsors and the speakers, more importantly. Um, and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. All right, so I must tell you, I saw John Palminteri a little while ago. He's, he's out here looking around somewhere and tried to bribe him to do my job. No, he wouldn't take the bribe. <laughs> Thanks. Um, 
So well, I want to uh, introduce you to numbers of people and just kind of inform you about what we're going to be looking at today. We have an amazing slate, you know, and, and uh, John was saying this to me. One of the ways to think about it, it, it's all starting here in Carpinteria. So many of these issues are, are centered in Carpinteria that affect our entire valley. And that makes this meeting so exciting. So let me start out by, first of all, I just want to thank our speakers who will be talking today. Certainly, Mayor Fred Shaw, Dr. Peter Rupert, and First Di District Supervisor Doss Williams. By the way, Doss, have you arrived yet? I haven't seen you come. I know he was busy, and some of you are already coming from the same meeting he was at um, this morning. Um, I want to thank several people who are instrumental in making all of this happen. Um, we've got Dr. Bob Berkemeyer over here in the corner, all of the work he does, and our, our slate of <laughs> slides. Thank you, Bob. Um, these beautiful flowers that are in the middle of your table, those are a gift of Harry and Michelle Van Wingerden, owners of Padero Floral and the, all of the floral arrangements. Harry, Michelle, where are you? There you are, back, okay? Um, and then you, we can't go anywhere without always thanking Mark and his staff for their beautiful work that they do and, and how they set up a room and, and just all of the wonderful food. So please give them a round of applause here. Okay, now to uh, save you from going to the chiropractor for hand claps, I'm going to suggest, hey, Doss, welcome. Grab some food. It's good. Um, I'm going to ask that um, you hold your applause till I, I finish kind of giving you all of the names of the people who have participated and are on our board right now. Um, first of all, um, we'll clap at the end. Carolyn Alarcon, chairman of the board, Reliant Notary. Please stand and just stay up. Um, the next we have Anthony Castillo, Alliance Wealth Strategies. Next we have Dave Durflinger, City of Carpinteria, over here. Shelly Nunes. She is our board treasurer with Meister and Nunes. Um, and then we've got Brian Falk, secretary. He's the guy you want to see if you clap too much. <laughs> All right. Um, Dora Lee Jacobson, Jack's Bistro and Famous Bagels. Dora Lee, there you are, over in this corner. Curtis Lopez, Mission Linen Supply, right here. And then Paul Wright, Island Brewing. If you'll all please give them a round of applause. They are... They are your volunteers for our Chamber of Commerce that make a huge difference in all that we do. Um, next, we have a couple of other people to let you know about. Our ambassadors, Carla Leah from Cox Communication. Are you here? There you are. Right here. Please stand up. Just let everybody know who you are. All right? And then we've got Daniel Estrada, Montecito Bacon Trust. Thank you. Hi, Daniel. And then we've got volunteers, Mary Beth Carty. And I didn't see her yet. And then our own Junior Carpenterian of the Year and scholarship recipient, Jeremy Saito. And Jeremy, I think you might be out front helping everybody come in. All right. Thank you all for being here. Next, I want to acknowledge and, and really let you all know how much we really appreciate our city officials. So I'm just going to go down the list. And if you, if you gentlemen will, and will please just stand, and then we can kind of acknowledge you at the end. Um, first is Mayor Fred Shaw. All right. And then next we have Vice Mayor Wade Namura. Yeah. Council Member Greg Carty. Then we have City Manager Dave Durflinger, who's here. Right there. And then Kevin Silk, assistant to city manager. And then we also have council member Al Clark. I also want to recognize uh, two other important, really important groups. We have um, general manager Craig Murray from the sanitary district. And then we have um, the president of that board, Lynn Graff, for sanitary district. And then I think we also have um, Shirley Johnson. She's on the board for the Water District in the back. And I don't see Bob McDonald here. Is Bob here? No. Okay, so please give them a round of applause. These are your city officials who are making a difference for our community. Other dignitaries, legislative representatives. We start with one of my favorites, Fire Chief Ray Navarro. Where are you, Ray? I, 
Oh, he had to leave. Oh, bummer, you missed out on him. He was a fun one. Uh, he's Carpentry of Summerlin Fire Protection District. Robert Lewin, Director of County of Santa Barbara, Office of Emergency Management. Yeah, go ahead and stand up. Make sure everybody can see you. All right. Next we have um, First District Supervisor, Doss Williams. And, and Legislative Representative, Ashley Cruzel. Where are you, Ashley? I talked to you earlier. All right. Um, Johnny Vasquez, Legislative Representative for Assembly Member Monique Limon. And then we also have Chris Henson, Legislative Representative for Congressman Salud Carvajal. Thank you for being here. Okay, next, what I would like to do is take a moment. Okay, it's a little longer than a moment. But what I want to do is give you the state of our Chamber of Commerce. and kind of get you, get you a little bit uh, informed about what we do here. Um, our Chamber is dedicated to creating a healthy local economy and building a strong environment for economic growth and sustainability. In order to achieve these goals, we represent business to government, coordinate educational forums, host networking events, advocate for business-friendly legislation, and promote community in all that we do. The Chamber is a 501c6. You probably thought I was going to say three. That's the only one I know. But it's a C6 nonprofit organization funded through Chamber memberships, sponsors, and fundraisers. So this is a passionate group of 15 volunteer board of directors 1.5 paid staffers. I think that means Joyce has a little mini-me that runs around. <laughs> and nearly 300 enthusiastic members that absolutely generously share their time, talents, and treasures. And together, we are dedicated to enhancing quality of life in the Carpinteria Valley and are proud to offer a very energetic and sunny environment in which our businesses flourish. The Chamber prides itself on providing networking opportunities that showcase their business and by bringing professionals together in an atmosphere conducive to increasing business leads and building camaraderie. Local businesses have become increasingly engaged with a wide range of new offerings that include things like legislative breakfasts, educational and informational forums, the bagel and brew recognition breakfasts, meet and greets, ribbon cuttings, grand opening celebrations, mixers, red carpet welcomes, member site visitations, best dressed window contest, don't forget the happy hours, the business expos, small business boardwalks, and then one of my favorites, the culinary crawl. And all of those are good examples of the ways that we are connecting businesses together and people with their businesses. The most latest is the one that was started in January 15th called Meet Me in Carpinteria. It's the latest social media campaign created in an effort to stimulate local economy and increase the visibility in the aftermath of the winter disasters. So, Who's got a guide? Can I borrow your guide? Yeah, there it is. I want you to, I want you to all take a look at this. Um, and by the way, our photographer, who is here taking photos, is the one who also did the front of this. Um, where are you? <laughs> there you are. And... and Absolutely awesome picture on the front. What we want to do is want to let you know that this recent launch of this one is getting rave reviews. Our goal this year was to tell the story of the emer emerging tech companies that are recognizing the face of Carpinteria as a future, as what we call the South Coast Tech Hub. And in order to showcase those tech companies, you know, what we did is we really tried to identify all of them and get their voice in this picture, in this picture, but also um, in, all of the, in all of the ways that we uh, represent that in this, 
in this magazine. It's, they did a great job with it. Another story is about the local educational institutions that are rising to the challenge and preparing our youth for the jobs of tomorrow. Um, then last but not least, there's an educational feature you want to check out on creating a sustainable future. And what it does is it actually showcases the projects that Carpinteria is undertaking to become more sustainable. Um, the one that we're most proud of is the one that our own chamber has accomplished by being green certified in Santa Barbara County. Now, that's huge. It's a big undertaking to do that. So it's a really cool thing. Um, it's just one of the most rewarding and impactful achievements, and it places the chamber in a position to lead by example and encourage other businesses to adopt an eco-friendly uh, business practice. All right. Um, the other thing, too, is we have an amazing new visitor center at our site. And one of the things you want to do next time you're on your way down with all of those visitors who come and staying at your home, on the way to Disneyland, stop in. Have a cup of coffee with Joyce. Check out the visitor center. It's a good idea. All right. Um, the chamber's also home to three other business offices, which share copy room, kitchenette, outdoor patio. So they've really revamped that area. And the other thing to know is that that um, conference room is available to any one of you, free of charge. So you might check into that. Um, so last but not least, we recently launched a very interactive website, which offers great visibility to our members and helpful resources for the community. So... In looking at all of that, I wanted to give you a little sense of then and now and just highlight a couple of features. So, for example, total revenue for the year 2017 was a little less than 263000 for the chamber. Right now, what we've collected to date is a little under um, 108000 our new website, the visits that launched, it launched about mid-August, was 12800 and in January to April, we've had already 9,500 hits. And the fun one is, where do these come from? You can find out where everything comes from. Um, that's about an average of about 80 per day. And then we see Santa Barbara, people are inquiring there. It's about 1,300. L.A., it's about 1,000. Isla Vista, they're looking, 381. And in San Francisco, even that far away, 334. Um, a lot of new chamber guides have been distributed. We've already distributed almost 9,000 of these, and last year it was 10,000. Um, we've got a lot of uh, social media going on, so Facebook followers like 1,200, and it just, just a lot going on there. Um, it's, it's always fun because when we look at the numbers, we look at Community Awards Bank, but this is after changing dates and everything. We only had 25 less than we had last year, and the state of this community event right now, um, 125, that was sold out last year, and this year it's sold out at 127, so that means two more of you snuck in, all right? So um, there, are, there are a lot more, and if you're interested in hearing more about that, you can certainly contact I or Joyce or any one of our board members, but I, I just wanted to take that moment and let you know about what's going on in the Chamber of Commerce, all right? So... Next, I'd like to bring up Joyce Donaldson. Joyce is our president and CEO, and all of those things that I was mentioning, it's her fault. She's responsible, and it's been an amazing ride with you, Joyce, so please come up. It's Joyce Donaldson. Hi, greetings, everybody, and happy Friday. Are you all happy it's Friday? Yeah, this is a great great way to launch your weekend. At this time, I would like to bring up a special guest that we have here today, Robert Lewin. He is the executive director of the Emergency Service of Santa Barbara, and he is the guy that kind of led us through all of, um, uh, kind of guided us. He felt like a friendly face on the news every night and kind of let us know what was going on with the winter disasters. And I, we have a plaque and some recognition here. We'd just like to give it to you. Would you like to say a few words, Robert? Thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce. And I, first of all, um, want to thank uh, the community of Carpinteria. You have all been through a lot, and uh, you are all amazing. Uh, it is clear that Carpinteria is open for business. 
And that's because all of you rallied and you continue to rally through whatever comes your way and continue to do what you do, and that is uh, provide a community that is healthy and inviting and wonderful. And uh, that's, that's great. And I also just want to say my appreciation uh, for the leadership that's in this room. Um, certainly, uh, all the way, uh, Congressman Carbajal and Assemblymember Lamone and uh, Senator Hannah Beth Jackson. But I especially want to say thank you to uh, the Honorable uh, Mayor Shaw, uh, Mr. City Manager, thank you very much, and particularly to the leadership that was provided by uh, Supervisor and Chair of the Board, uh, Doss Williams. Uh, he is always watching out for you and making sure we at the county were doing everything we could, not just for the county, but for the cities that were that are in this county and uh, appreciate that very much. And so on behalf of all the folks that worked in the Emergency Operations Center, and at times that, w that was, it probably totaled uh, uh, 500 plus people rotating in and out of there over the last three months of the, during the disaster. And on behalf of all of them, I, I appreciate this recognition that you're all providing to us. Thank you. Thank We recognized all of our um, emergency service uh, organizations at our community awards banquet, which was postponed a few times. We recently held it on March 10th, and we had a large showing of uh, all of the fire chiefs and, and sheriff department. But Robert's department that day, we were actually under a, yet another threat of evacuation. So his office was too busy to come, rightfully so. So thank you, Robert. Thank you all for everything that you've done to make our city safe. At this time, I'd like to bring up Mayor Fred Shaw. We um, are very fortunate to have such a highly esteemed mayor, a mayor that's super present in our community. He sits by my side at every meeting. He is there at every ribbon cutting, meet and greet, every meet me in Carpentria. Fred is just a guy out and about in town, and we really appreciate your constant presence. Welcome. Thank you, Joyce. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for all of you being here. This is a big crowd. We're really pleased about that. Uh, after a difficult few months, the most important takeaway is that Carpinteria is still here, strong and resilient. We might be a little singed around the edges, but uh, it's still a beautiful place to live and work. So what's going on in the community? Well, as everyone in the room is aware, many of our businesses took a huge hit during the Thomas fire and the ensuing floods. Concerns about the fire and temporary closures of the freeway during the months of December and January kept many visitors and shoppers away in the lead up to Christmas and beyond. Employees couldn't get to work, or if they could, the ash on the street from the, from the fire had businesses, especially restaurants, closing their doors to avoid major cleanup to their interiors. In the same time frame, wireless infrastructure was compromised by both the fire and the ensuing floods. With the complete closure of the 101 freeway, well, except for emergency personnel, we were cut off both north and south, and circling all the way around on State Route 5, if we could, just wasn't a practical solution for most folks. And here we speak to the resilience of the Carpinteria business community and the unflagging efforts of the chamber and the city. The city worked with the community to facilitate distribution of over 30,000 masks during the fire and to keep residents informed with informational postings at City Hall and at Albertsons in Casitas Plaza. Our public works, fire and law enforcement work 24-7 to keep our community safe and secure and our major roadways clear of debris. Our businesses hunkered down and looked inward to do internal work and other tasks while our streets were empty of shoppers and diners. In the end, our business community came through it all, not unscathed, but still standing. To my knowledge, not a single business closed as a result of the fire and flood. Since that time, the Chamber has redoubled its efforts to bring people 
back to our shops, restaurants, and community. There are community efforts go or activities going on almost daily in support of maintaining a vibrant small city. On 90th anniversary of our local Alcazar Theater, the grand opening of our community garden, and celebrations like the annual awards banquet and the Rotary Talent Show, just to name a few. And how did our beach survive all of this? Many of our residents saw firsthand the work of some 3,000 trucks bringing sediment from the floods down to Ash Avenue, 28,000 cubic yards to be exact. And with the dredging project just finished in the salt marsh, our Franklin and Santa Monica creeks are now clear of some additional 26,000 cubic yards of sediment and flowing to the ocean. It was painful to see our beaches covered in the debris and our ocean waters brown with mud and silt, but in the end, it was the best of a bunch of bad choices. Mother Nature decided to bring the runoff from the fire to us in a couple of days rather than over an entire rainy season. But again, Carpinteria showed its resilience. Our beach is now clear and open for safe public use. Continuing with positive news, the work on the freeway widening project is going much faster than was originally projected. By changing the scheduling of projects within the overall work plan, Caltrans has moved ahead the expected finish date of Phase 3, the replacement of the Linden and Casitas Pass interchanges, by nearly a full year. Yeah, there's still a lot of work to do, but we can already see a lot of the work is done on the new bridges over Carpinteria Creek. Casitas Pass has already moved traffic to the new section of bridge over the freeway, and demolition and rebuilding of the old bridge span will begin this summer, giving us two more lanes going across the freeway. The Linden Avenue Bridge will close for three weeks, except for pedestrian or bicycle traffic, in just a few days. But in the end, we'll have a much more community-friendly overcrossing with bike and pedestrian lanes on both sides and another traffic lane. Anyone who exits the freeway coming north at Casitas Pass sees that Via Real is already open to foot and bike traffic. Over the next year, Via Real should be open through to Linden and the new roundabout and northbound on-ramp completed. We're also thrilled to learn that funding from Senate Bill 1 will complete the funding for several important projects. One, the, hot, the widening of Highway 101 phases Phases 4A through C is now funded, and the first phases is going to add the lane in each direction between Baylord and Summerlin, and that will begin in Carpentry in the spring of 2020. And let's not forget another vital piece of this project, commuter train service. Amtrak now runs another morning and late afternoon train between the south into Santa Barbara and Goleta to facilitate alternatives the freeway gridlock for the 30,000-plus cars that come into and through Carpinteria each day on their way to work. MTD has stepped up to provide bus service to and from train stops into the business cores. We recently received big news that Senate Bill 1 is also have funding, has been approved to build an Amtrak siding and a new platform here in Carpinteria. That project includes a pedestrian un undercrossing near Holly and a pedestrian trail connection to 7th Street. The project would allow scheduling of more commuter traffic along the 101 rail corridor without interfering with the commercial railroad traffic that passes through our city. And it would also improve pedestrian safety and convenience between the beach area, Aliso School, and resident residential areas to the north. Lastly, as the freeway project moves forward, two, two trail projects are now completely funded. The Rincon Trail project has been funded and is expected to move forward in 2019 and 2020. Also part of that freeway widening includes a trail connecting the western end of Carpinteria Avenue here to Santa Claus Lane. I know it's been a long, sometimes painful process getting here, but in the end, we're going to see a transportation infrastructure project that will be the envy of other coastal cities. Turning now to another big issue in Carpinteria, let's talk about cannabis. 
Until July 1st, the state is in a transition period, so licensing and controls at that level have been sketchy at best. The county is slowly moving towards its licensing and regulatory structure, and the city has initiated the work to create our own regulations. As you're probably all aware, fully 30% of all cannabis in the county is grown in the Carpinteria Valley, and the city continually works closely throughout the county's regulatory process to ensure that this growing industry develops in a responsible manner, compatible with our small town. Council recently gave city staff direction on what areas of the cannabis industry they might consider as workable within city limits. Staff is working on how to implement and regulate these pursuits. The City Council is having staff draft options for regulating cannabis distribution, delivery, manufacturing, and testing. Commercial growing and storefront, storefront retail operations will not be allowed within city limits. As we're all aware, cannabis odor has had a major impact on many of our residents. Many of our Carpinteria Valley growers are currently addressing this, some a lot better than others. Our hope is that once the county finishes its regulatory work and the state moves from its transition period, enforcement to facilitate stringent olfactory controls and mitigate other impacts will be in place. The city will continue to advocate for our residents at both the county and the state level. I'd be remiss if I did not discuss city finances. Carpinteria has a long history of being fiscally conservative and making prudent use of limited resources. The city's liabilities, such as pensions, unlike some other cities, are manageable and under control. While we remain in a good financial position, expenses are growing significantly for all services, including street and park maintenance and police services. We're having to use more and more of our reserves for basic operating costs. Last year, our five-year financial plan identified a shortfall in the millions annually. Maintenance and care of our parks and open space costs hundreds of thousands of dollars beyond current assessments that were set back in the 80s and early 90s. Our roads and other infrastructure are deteriorating faster than we can keep up with it. In fact, about 50% of Carpinteria's roads are rated poor or very poor. Over the past couple of years, the city has spent a million dollars of our reserves on pavement maintenance projects, but we need to invest about one and a half million dollars each year moving forward to begin catching up. Law enforcement costs are expected to rise 30% over the next five years, and new expenses for state mandated but unfortunately unfunded, clean water and accessibility improvements need to be addressed. A long history of community decisions have allowed Carpinteria to remain the charming and unique beach town that it is, and we are at another critical decision point. The amount of city revenues and cost-saving measures no longer cover projected shortfalls. In response, we are asking the community about a sales tax increase. In January, we surveyed residents. 650 people participated, and more than 65% of the respondents would support a one and a quarter cent sales tax increase. Many people feel a sales tax, in tax increase is a fair way to share costs with visitors that use our streets and parks when they visit. About 50% of all that revenue would derive from visitor spending. A local tax increase of about one and a quarter percent would bring approximately $2.3 million into the city annually. This would allow the city to fund overdue street and park maintenance, new mandates related to stormwater filtration, increased, public, increased police costs, and services we all care about, like the library and our youth programs. To this end, the city council asked that we gather more community feedback. We've passed out a bit of information today. Please take a moment and fill out a comment card before you leave. 
Later this month, we'll report community comments back to the City Council to help determine whether placing a tax measure on the November ballot is a good idea. So there you have it. We in Carpinteria are resilient. As a community, we rise to the challenge, whether it's dealing with fire and floods or looking ahead and planning a strong future. I am sure that Professor Rupert and Supervisor Williams will flesh out some of these topics in their remarks. Thank you all for being here today and for taking the time to invest in Carpinteria. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor Shaw. Great, as always. Thank you for all the information. I know you're all quickly taking notes. There are some notepads and pens on your table, thanks to Cox Communications. I'd also like to take this time to just let you know that um, this luncheon couldn't be possible without all of our gracious sponsors. And just to name a few, uh, of course, we have Cox Communications. Our gold sponsors include Latitude 34 Technologies, Meister & Noons, Montecito Bank & Trust, Rincon Events, Southern California Edison, UC Santa Barbara, and our silver sponsors include Alliance Wealth Strategies, the City of Carpentria, E.J. Harrison and Sons, Jack's Bistro and Famous Bagels, Marburg Industries, Padero Floral, and the Tobes Group. So thank you again. We really appreciate your sponsorship. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Peter Rupert. He is with the UCSB Economic Project. He has some really great um, information to share with you. I've been following him. I feel like I'm stalking him. <laughs> He's been speaking all around Santa Barbara County, and the information that he has is just phenomenal. So you may want to get out those pens and pencils and take note of some of these statistics he's going to give you. And he's going to give you um, specifically for Carpentria, probably for the greater Santa Barbara County, but then kind of narrow and bring it home for uh, Carpentria. So we're going to be able to really find out what a unique and tight market that we live in. Dr. Rupert. So uh, some technical problems. Bob's trying to get the slides up. You're welcome. Uh, first, it's an honor to be here and uh, uh, share this with uh, the mayor and, and Doss. Uh, who, by the way, work really hard for, for you guys and for me. So really give them a round of applause. They're, they just... <clears throat> and everything the mayor said, I, you know, I, I agree with. I think that uh, the community really did come together, which was amazing. Uh, my problem with that is I think that the community should come together more often, not just after a disaster, but all the time. You know? so, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, you know, what that might mean if the slides ever come up, but, uh, yeah. How come your slides work, Mayor? <laughs> so, Peter, I don't have any slides to need me to stall for you. Oh, that's a good idea. Good idea. Okay, so Doss Williams. Uh, <laughs> Thank, thank you for the introduction. Um, so uh, uh, I will depart from the normal uh, state of most of the time you're always supposed to say the state of whatever you're talking about is strong. Um, the state of the county is shaky, right? but getting better. Um, and I mean this both uh, because uh, of the factors that were pre-existing to the disaster, but even more so because of the disaster. I think I updated you last year on uh, the fiscal woes of the county and the challenges, um, mainly precipitated by a very arcane uh, question, which is just what rate of return the county expects in its pension fund. And that one quarter point change, um, or the difference between a quarter point change, which we are um, expecting and a two-quarter point changes was the difference between being in the black and being $30 million in deficit. Now we have compounded on top of that the challenges of the natural disaster and the fiscal disaster that has followed it. Um, to give you a, a scale of 
uh, the insecurity that we are looking at is I, I think everybody knows here that it, it really and, and we should really give a lot of credit to uh, a couple people, including Rob and Tom Farum in flood control um, for successfully in a very short window of time. Uh, first, Rob being our prophet of doom and then Tom executing the excavation of all of our debris basins before the flow, right? This is what made really the principal difference between what um, uh, happened here in Carboneria and what could have happened, which was something that looked much more um, like Montecito. We could have looked like Montecito if those debris basins had not been um, fully effective. And, um, but the cost of emptying those debris basins uh, before and after the flood um, is equivalent to eight years worth of funding of the flood control district. Okay? So if we have to, and just after um, the, the minor, minor storms, um, we had to empty some of those basins again. Next year, we may have to empty them again. And if it is not an emergency, we don't get the federal match. So there, uh, that is just, you know, exhibit A, but one of uh, an alphabet soup of exhibits of fiscal challenges that come from the disaster. What happens? How do you cover things that are unreimbursed? How long is there a property tax loss? How long is there a TOT loss? And how do you pay for if the mountain comes down slowly rather than fast? Meaning if the mountain comes down fast, we have a clear and present public safety danger. If the mountain comes down slowly, we have a huge fiscal uh, disaster. So um, my solution to this, um, uh, to this it can be summed up, um, buy more chocolate and less gas. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, well, I mean, uh, one of the businesses that suffered from the disasters is our own chocolate factory down, down the street, down there. So, um, you know, one of the ways you can do is patronize local businesses. And if you don't like chocolate, you can always choose beer um, uh, or our very other productions here in Carpinteria. Um, my point is uh, every time you use your dollars – it is a vote for what kind of community you want to live in. And um, if we keep on taking the easy way out to save a couple bucks, we're going to tank our own businesses, right? Um, and on the other side, uh, we all know this was a climate-enhanced event. Um, if we don't kind of wake up and realize that as consumers, we have more power over issues like pollution, climate change, and the enhancement of natural disasters that comes from that, um, then we're not taking away really the lessons of resiliency that we should from such a horrible event. I mean, let's, let's get to the deepest part of this. People are disturbed by this because um, not only was a great loss of property, but that always happens with our natural disasters but because we lost people forever from our community, right? And because it sort of touched something deeper. Because living in this place, you can, you can start to believe that the darkness that is um, the challenges that most of humanity faces every day somehow doesn't touch us here. Well, it touched us here. We are touched by darkness like everyone else. But we as consumers have tremendous power about where we go from here. Um, let me talk about some of the good news uh, fiscally. Number one, um, both through the May revise last, um, last, week, last week and through the conversations um, that we've had uh, with the governor's office and the legislature since, um, there is a commitment at the state to backfill part of the, uh, pr the property taxes um, and maybe – a commitment to um, help, like they did in Northern California, take care of part of the local match for cleanup. 
That would be huge. We're working on that. Um, number two, um, the other bright spot is we've rene renegotiated agreements with our collective bargaining. Uh, uh, that is our, the majority of our employees at the county to pick up a larger share of their pension cost. And this was the unfinished business of the pension reform law that we passed at a state level. It had a trigger by which um, changes could be made at a local level. Otherwise, um, local jurisdictions would have more power to impose upon it. So we work together with um, our workers, and, and mostly these are workers uh, represented by uh, Service Employees International Union, SEIU, and uh, to achieve something that is balanced, um, we, um, we'll, but we will end in us having less uh, pension risk in the long run. Um, oh, and before I move on, I, I also really want to say there's one, one other party besides uh, Tom Farum, um and our flood control district and our emergency personnel that deserve real uh, um, thanks on the emptying of debris basins and the involvement of, of the Army Corps and FEMA, and that is Salute Carbo Hall and Chris, um, thank you very much for the support that we got. Um, so, um, and then um, the other, uh, I would say, positive thing um, uh, that, but one that's vital is that um, we won't see the same level of cuts that we saw last year um, uh, at the county, um, and part of that is we. We really did bite the bullet hard last year, um, and part of that is uh, you really don't want me to prepare a budget that doesn't include a cannabis tax because really it will be really, really, really bad. So um, we are taking a little bit of a, a risk here and a little bit of faith in you, um, i.e. that um, uh, we are preparing a budget that partially includes cannabis tax revenue that you won't vote on until June. Now, we won't vote for our final budget until we know whether or not you have passed that. But if Measure T does not pass, uh, most importantly for Carpinteria, we will not have the wherewithal to move from a reactionary enforcement regime with cannabis, which we all know has, has only closed a handful of places a year. Um, our goal is to move to a proactive enforcement regime, you can't do that without money, right? And my whole strategy has been, okay, let's permit the, the better ones and use their money to clamp down and take out of business the ones that aren't high road businesses, right? Well, that strategy fails if you don't back me up. So please vote for Measure T. It is something, from my understanding, that has been advocated both by the high road growers here in town and um, the folks that have been most vociferous in their opposition to marijuana in town. And I think that's very logical. The only people who should be against the marijuana tax, in my mind, are uh, marijuana growers that don't want to play by the rules because that is the only people it will help for that measure to fail. Um, the, um, and that leads me to libraries. This is one of the um, ways. Uh, you can see that my mind works like a James Joyce novel, um, but there is a logical connection to that between them, um, uh, which is that nowhere is the prospects uh, or the the results of underfunded government um, going to be most uh, felt by us than in our library. Let me give you. Uh, some dollar figures. Our um, operating expenditures for the library um, are th $389,000, right? <clears throat> the fiscal shortfall for next year is $147,000, right? So the question before us is how do we operate a $390,000 library um, with $147,000 less money than that. And this threatens a lot of important things. Just when we have gotten a permanent, skilled 
librarian position filled with a talented young woman uh, who's now helping us out at the CARP Library, um, that puts that in a little danger. It puts hours of operation in danger. It puts the extra help in danger. So we've got to pass Measure T. We've got to pass the sales tax. And the city and county have to really maintain um, or increase their commitment to libraries, right? Um, uh, you know, I, um, the, the city stepped up last year. Um, they, they've got to step up again. Um, we're, um, last year, there was one city that paid a lower portion of their libraries, and I hassled them, and now they, they pay more of the libraries. Both of us are going to have to step up more for this to happen, and maybe you can also step up more because the Friends of the Library is our biggest partner there. You can make a difference in the interim and help our Friends of the Library with, and you could even say, this is a designated gift for this year to get us through before we get um, the sales tax because getting through this year is going to be the toughest challenge Going forward, if we pass this, a sales tax at the city, we pass the marijuana tax at the county, both of us will, should have the wherewithal to be able to do more. But without that, um, uh, we will close the library to have to reopen it or close it many days a week only to uh, reopen it if we're successful uh, in, on this ballot and in the fall. With that, I just want to see if there's any super burning questions because I've already had the, the flag pulled. Well, I have to say during um, the darker times, uh, more than any time, it's been an honor to work with the elected officials and community members among you, and more of an honor and more fulfilling for me than ever to be able to be there working on your behalf. Uh, you know, if everything was going along swimmingly, I might not um, feel that way as, mu as intensely as I do, but... but because of how rough it's been, I feel more a part of this community, more uh, intensely dedicated to working on your behalf and, and, and feeling more like our work, even in this intimidating time, really makes a difference. Thank you so much. Once again, let me introduce Dr. Peter Rubert. Okay, that's what I meant about Doss steps up for people. Instead of me standing up here look like a dork, he, uh, he stepped up. Um, anyway, thanks very much uh, uh, for inviting me. Uh, I want to mention a couple things. We did something about a month ago uh, about the uh, disasters at the Libero Theater. Some of you may have attended that. Um, and um, you can go to our website, UCSB Economic Forecast Project, and these are all the slides from all the presenters. Uh, we had the uh, um, insurance commissioner there. Uh, Joe Holland, uh, people from the county, city, you know, basically talking about what, what's happening. And the other thing we have up there is something we're starting, we started this year, along with uh, Montecito Bank and Trust, um, Hutton Parker. Uh, it's a community indicators project. We do the economic forecast project. This is really about the health of the community. This is about nonprofits, education, uh, environment, et cetera. So you can go to our website. It's, uh, it's, it's downloadable. So... Um, so please go see that. There we go. Okay. So there's a lot of uncertainties out there, and they affect all of us. Some of them are natural disasters, as we've seen. Um, what's the uncertainty? How are we going to recover from the, from the fires and the debris flow? Well, if you listen to the insurance commissioner, your insurance rates are going up. Fire insurance is going up. Um, secondly, coverage. He mentioned that... Uh, um, many people are not going to be covered. They're going to have to go to the FAIR plan. And the FAIR plan, to me, isn't very fair. It's like uh, three to five times the cost of normal insurance. So they're redoing all the maps now, the fire maps. Uh, what he mentioned was that many of the insurance companies did not have the right uh, um, uh, risk models, and they're redoing all the risk models. So that was a little bit of bad news for us. We're recovering. Obviously, that makes us a little bit poorer. Um, What's it going to do for housing demand and supply in Montecito, Carpinteria, Santa Barbara? It's a little bit unknown, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, what's it going to mean for retail, leisure, and hospitality here in, the, here in our area? 
So all these things are important, um, you know, that we have to understand. So there are also unnatural disasters, like trade, tariffs, immigration policy, um, uh, minimum wages. All these things are person-made. I would say man-made, but I'm a PC person. They're a person-made. Um, so, but, but, but history really tells us a bunch of things, and so I want to do two quick little things. One is this graph. This graph just says we recover from things all the time. We recovered from the Great Depression, World War II, and as I always like to say, you look at this graph, choose your most hated president of all time, you don't see them there. It's kind of beautiful. There is something we're seeing it now. We're seeing this bit up here that we're kind of off this long-run trend. This is real GDP, by the way. What's real GDP? It's your income. The red line means, on average, we grow about 2% per year. We get richer 2% per year in real terms every year. Right? So that's, what, that's where we are. And we have to get back to that red line. That's all I have to say. And so we have to work at that. But, so let me talk a little bit about what happened after fire. This is some of the stuff we talked about at Libero. So what I did was... Um, I got tw uh, from the uh, houses that were destroyed, we had 262 assessor parcel numbers. We took those parcel numbers and we saw what happened later. It turns out that you can see that um, 202 of them had improvements, that is, they rebuilt their homes. By the way, 53 did not. That's about 20% of homes that were not rebuilt due to the fire from the T fire. The same with the Jesucito fire. About 20%, a little less than 20% of homes were not rebuilt. So what happens now is we have fewer homes. People were not rebuilding those homes. They're sitting as vacant properties, basically, is what's happening. Um, Sonoma County, 5% of all homes in Sonoma County were destroyed in the fires. It was an incredible, horrible event. Um, uh, and I talked to the, some realtors up there and, and people. They don't know what's happening with the, this, the demand right now. People are moving out of that area. So what's going to happen to housing prices? Well, there's lower supply because the homes are destroyed, and they're not rebuilding many of them. They're in a, in a bad area. Um, and the lower supply, that's going to increase prices. If demand also goes down, now, then that's going to decrease prices. So we still don't know what's going to happen up in Sonoma. We don't know what's going to happen really after the tea fire. We haven't, it hasn't all uh, really settled yet. So the debris flow, um, I was lucky enough to talk to several people in the Public Works Department. Um, so Public Works in Montecito, they're responsible for about 15% of the land in Montecito, the streets, the sides of the streets, et cetera. Um, and, you know, what the mayor was talking about removing, you know, um, mud and things, they removed 500,000 cubic yards. Now, that, those numbers don't mean anything to anybody, so that's why I put uh, one truck holds 10 cubic yards. That was 50,000 truckloads that had to be pulled out of here. Heavy trucks, dump trucks. I put poor roads. So the mayor mentioned that we're going to have to put money aside for roads. You're going to have to put a little more money aside because the roads have been damaged um, by, these, uh, by the trucks. Um, uh, they spent $24 million on cleaning and removal. That's $24 million that could have been spent on other things. So the point of all this is, you know, it makes us poorer at the end of the day, right? We had to spend money on these things. Army Corps of Engineers, um, uh, Doss mentioned, uh, they spent $80 million on cleanup, $30 million on removal. So the Army Corps came in and did a, did a fantastic job quickly. Um, our public works department, first responders, uh, all fantastic. Um, so what did we do about that? We got together with some chambers, with uh, um, uh, women in economic adventures, et cetera, and we distributed a survey. And so what I want to ask you right now is we're going to have to do it again. We sent it to all the businesses through the chambers. If you get one of these surveys from UCSB, please fill it out. Because we don't get very good data locally from the government. So we need to sort of get it from you. So I, I, I just I ask you to fill it out, and we can all learn from it. And I'll show you what we learned just from, from what we've done. So what we tried to do with this survey is we sent it out. We asked things like, how, much did you, how many hours did you have to close? How many days? How many people did you lay off? What happened to your revenue? Are you going to come back? Are you going to hire people back? Do you think you'll survive? Those are the kind of questions we wanted to find out from, from individuals. Um, we only got 293 responses, 93% of them from the south coast, so this area right here, um, and South Santa Barbara, Montecito, et cetera. So what did it look like? Well, who was affected? The top two industries that said they were affected, um, basically this is how important is tourism to your business, 
Um, 33% of them said it's very important for their, for their business. And so what that means is that, you know, these businesses are now going to be affected if people decide not to come back as tourists, which I'm sure they will. It's just a beautiful area here, of course. This one says closures. Over 60% of responders had to close their business for at least some time. 60% of all the responders had to close businesses. On average, they were closed for 13 days. That's lost revenue. That's lost tax revenue. That's lost customers. You know, you name it. It's, it's, it's been hard on the businesses. We talked about people coming together. As I mentioned, the banks did a great job. They, you know, they helped out the business that they could. FEMA was great. Um, they're a little bit uppity, FEMA, but, you know, they, they, they were really good. Um, uh, it's like when the FBI comes into the police, you know, and they say, hey, we know our business, you know, get out of our way. But um, they were actually re- really, really good. What this one says is uh, the longest closure has been 72 days. Do you foresee permanently closing your business um, uh, over that? About 10% said that, you know, they're going to have trouble. They're going to need some financing. They may or may not survive. And these are the kind of answers they gave. I'm not sure what's going to happen. We're trying not to close permanently. It depends on the rebound that we're going to see. Doss mentioned, you know, we have money. We can, our con- as consumers, we can, we can help. Um, lost so much revenue in December. Depends on financial recovery. Hope not. So those are the kinds of things that actual businesses, were re- how they were responded. Um, employment, 50% of them had to lay off at least one employee. Total reported layoffs, 213 employees were laid off during this time period. 13 businesses do not plan to rehire those people. So again, this is a lot of people who are now out of work, um, you know, that uh, could be consuming and, and, you know, we have to help them. So now I want to move a little bit to the local, some local labor market stuff, some national and local labor markets. Um, This is the unemployment rate for Carpinteria. Um, You see the blue line? That's what the... um, uh, Employment Development Department of California gives you, don't go to their website. That's just not helpful, that blue line. Why is it? It's seasonally unadjusted. You have to go to the Economic Forecast Project to get this graph. Seasonal adjustment means, this red line means we get rid of the seasonal part of stuff. Because Carpinteria, uh, Santa Barbara, all these places are very uh, seasonal. We have seasonal tourism, we have seasonal agriculture, etc. Why do I say that's important? Well, if you, look at the, if you look at this part over here, you know, it looks like, wow, you know, it, it was really bad. Unemployment went up a lot. Well, the seasonally adjusted thing said, no, it didn't. It always happens that it goes up at that time period. So many reporters always come to me and say, oh, my God, we're in trouble. And I say, no, no, it's December, you know, or it's J- July or whatever. Um, so look at this red line. What the red line says is seasonally adjusted unemployment rate in Carpinteria is 3.36%. By the way, unemployment rates really never get less than that. I mean, it can go to two point something in small lo- locations like here in Santa Barbara, but we're pretty much as low as we're ever going to be. Um, so, you know, that's a fantastic thing. The economy's pretty doing pretty well. This is Santa Barbara. As I mentioned, it can go lower, so this is 2.52. Um, so again, you know, our areas are doing really, really well in certain dimensions. This is an ugly picture. Um, this is weekly hours. So when you look at the U.S., this is the green line in the U.S. These are average weekly hours for employees. And you can see it's right a little bit over 34. It doesn't move around very much because everything kind of washes out when you get into the aggregate, when you get into the U.S. But if you look at local communities, it responds amazingly. So you can see, for example, the red is Ventura County. Ventura you know, up and down, their hours go up and down. This is Santa Barbara County. Horrible. So relative to Ventura, we're just not doing very well in terms of, uh, our, you know, working. This fell, by the way, during the Great Recession. This blue bar here is the Great Recession. This fell down to 28 hours per week on average. That's terrible, by the way. You guys need to work more. <laughs> you can't be coming here and, you know, having good lunches. You've got to be out there working. Um, but now you can see we've kind of recovered, and, and we're, we're about the U.S. average now. We're right around 30, 33 to 34, which is, which is pretty typical. So here again, so Ventura is always red, Santa Barbara is blue, and the U.S. is green. This is goods producing. So this is manufacturing. So goods are, you know, manufactured goods and construction, houses. These are goods. So what you can see is it's very volatile. Even in the U.S., the green, it's very volatile. Again, you can see the blue bars are recessions, and you can see what happens during recessions that goods production falls a lot. The problem is, if you look at Santa Barbara, we're not even close to where we were 
back before the Great Recession. In terms of employment, goods, goods employment has fallen tremendously. It's fallen, um, uh, you know, about 10, 15 percent in just a few years. So, again, employment in the goods sector, it's not rebounding. It just hasn't rebounded. It's slowly, gro- slowly growing. Um, and, by the way, the same with Ventura and the same with the U.S. They haven't really gotten back to, to where they were before. If we look at services, services are growing, growing really well. However, again, Santa Barbara seems we're lagging. Santa Barbara County is lagging in terms of employment growth in services. This is Ventura County, the red, and this is the U.S. in green. And you can see that back in 1990, we, I, I, I put everybody at the same, and then you can see Santa Barbara just had slow, slow growth, and we are higher than we were before the Great Recession, however. Not true for all industries. As an exa- so this is uh, leisure and hospitality. Again, Santa Barbara seems to be lagging behind in employment. My view of this, partly, is these are these person-made disasters. Why aren't we growing like the U.S.? Look at Ventura. Ventura has just taken off in terms of leisure and hospitality. So it's not that leisure and hospitality is you know, going away. Uh, it's just that Santa Barbara seems to be kind of slow, um, as we've been for a while. Uh, education and health services. By the way, to me, the you know, solution to a lot of these problems is education and better health. So uh, that's been growing. Again, we lag. Many of you hear financial stuff. This is really bad, right? This is employment in the financial industry. Finance, insurance, real estate. What happened in Santa Barbara County? I put it here at 1 in 1990. We suffered. We grew. Great that we had the recession. We were flat, and then after the Great Recession, we have fallen by 20% in terms of employment in financial insurance, real estate. And by the way, Ventura has as well, not the U.S. The U.S. is, is higher than it was uh, before the Great Recession. So these are things that, you know, for our particular counties, where we seem to be suffering. Is retail that thing? That's a skull and crossbones if you can't see it in the back. Is retail dead? I hear this all the time. People come to me and say, your retail's dead. Amazon's going to take over the world. They're doing a pretty good job of it, I have to say. But um, retail is not dead. By the way, if people sit home and don't ever go out, we've got a bigger problem than retail being dead. Right? I mean, people want to go out. The problem is we don't have the right stores. Things are changing. You know, people aren't going to buy toilet paper at the store anymore. I buy it from Amazon. I wake up in the morning, there's a big stack of toilet paper on my, you know. Sometimes the, they delivered it, sometimes other people put it there. But, um, <laughs> um, but this is how bad Santa Barbara's doing in terms of retail. Retail's not dead. People are going to want to shop. They're going to shop differently. And that's why we have to sort of think as a community how we're going to shop, what we're going to do for, these, for our, for our uh, retail s- stuff. So, for example... I think many of these anchor stores are going to go away. What we're going to see are things like in the funk zone in Santa Barbara, where there's going to be a place to, to drink, a place to eat. There's a little boutique inside some of these places. You know, it's going to, people want an experience. And by the way, I think that many of these things that we've seen before, um, in terms of leasing, I'll show that in a second, aren't going to be too good. But this is what I mean by it's not dead. It just seems dead in Santa Barbara for some reason. Why is that? This is Ventura again. Look what's happened since the Great Recession. Ventura employment... In, um, in retail has gone up by about 15, 20%. It's all about beer. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, this is the U.S. Again, the U.S. And, and Ventura have surpassed where they were in the Great Recession. This is Santa Barbara. We've, we've sunk like a stone, and we still seem to be falling in terms of retail employment. But what this says to me is retail's not dead. It's just we need to figure this out here. We need to work a little bit harder to figure out why it is our retail uh, sector seems to be uh, failing a little bit. So my belief is that retail is going to be disrupted for a while, and we have to get used to that. What's going to happen is it's not that we have too many stores. We have the wrong stores. As I said, people aren't going downtown for transaction purposes anymore. They're going down for entertainment. You want to be able to take the kids, have it, you know, do all these things. So that's how we have to change. Um, 
That's what this means. We're moving towards a shopping experience. I don't know if you've heard of what's called omnichannel. A lot of advertisers using stuff called omnichannel. What does that mean? It means that some people shop online and they buy online. Some people shop online and buy in the store. Some people shop at the store and buy online. All our stores are going to have to have these mechanisms. You're going to have to be able to shop online and then go down and pick it up at the store. You know, so all these things are changing in, the, in, in this environment. I believe that we have to change our financing structures. So uh, owners, landlords, banks, etc. we're not going to see Walmart come in for a 20-year lease. That's not going to happen. We have to, work, we have to work with some new boutiques. We have to work with some new entrepreneurs. What I mean by that is we have to think about maybe six-month leases. Like, hey, that's a really good idea. Why don't you try it out, see if people are going to come. Don't sell your soul to have to sign a 20-year lease if it doesn't work. So these kinds of things have to be adjustable and, and useful. Um, I am seeing some financial stress out there in this industry, by the way. And where is that coming from? It's coming from the fact that many years ago, interest rates were low and financing was easy. What did that do? It took some of these businesses that should have gone under and it let them borrow money for the future to hope they could survive, and many did not. These things are coming due now. In the U.S., these high-risk borrowings are maturing, $1.9 billion in 2018. After 2018, there's going to be $5 billion a year for the next five years um, in terms of these high-risk loans coming. And by the way, most of them can't pay it back. That's the point. So there's going to be some stress there. Uh, real estate. So real estate has come back a bit. It's not back where it was. And by the way, that may be good. I know if you own your home, you want it to be really you know, uh, expensive, but... Um, Santa Barbara, uh, Montecito was higher than the previous peak back in 2005. It's the only city in Santa Barbara that is higher than the previous peak. Um, Santa Barbara City is right about the previous peak. Carpinteria is about 93% of what it used to be at the highest level. Um, but growth in Carpinteria is higher, and inventory is fairly low. So this is a picture of uh, various cities, um, and this is, as I mentioned, this is Zillow Home Value Index. Um, I hate Zillow. Um, so every time I look at it, I think, God, my house is worth more than that. Why does Zillow keep telling me it's worth less? It bothers me. But it's great for trends. Zillow does a, they have a great statistical staff. It's really good for trends. So what do we see? We see that we, you know, housing prices grew. The dark blue is Santa Barbara County, by the way. The red is Carpinteria. The blue is Goleta. And green is the city of Santa Barbara. And so what you can see is only Montecito is above where it used to be uh, at its previous peak. That's here. Everybody else is still, there's Santa Barbara City. Here is Carpinteria. So again, they're about 93% of what it used to be. This is the growth rate. So I can tell you now, if you see growth rates like this, like in Montecito, at 35% per year, ain't sustainable. That's not going to happen, Right? Uh, it'll happen for a little bit, and then you know what? That. It just, you can't sustain those kind of housing prices growth. So what we're seeing today, and by the way, here was a great recession. You can see we fell by over 20% in the growth rates. We came back, had another little dip. We came up, and now we're here. Carpinteria growth rate is the highest right now of these cities. It's about 7%, a um, uh, uh, little over uh, 7.5% is out here. That's sustainable. Maybe. 5% is kind of sustainable in the long run, but this is much better than seeing numbers like this. If you see numbers like this, it's not going to last. I mean, I wish it would, but it just doesn't. These are for sale inventories. So you can see what happened in the Great Recession. Um, after the Great Recession, um, inventories fell like crazy. Again, you can see Carpinterias in red. They're here. This is Goleta. So Goleta has been building a lot recently. And that building a lot means there's more inventory for sale in Goleta. Uh, commercial, it actually remains very strong. As I mentioned before, retail is not dead. Commercial stuff isn't really dead. Um, we've seen some recent increases in vacancies. This is for Carpinteria. These are office vacancy rates uh, and, and prices. So the, the blue bar, the dark blue bar, is the asking rate. The light blue bar is the achieved rate that they actually got for these, built, for these uh, spaces per square foot. And the red line is vacancy rates. So you can see coming out of the Great Recession, vacancy rates were high. 
prices were a little bit deflated. Then as we came out of it, prices started to rise a little bit. Vacancy rates fell. And now usually what happens is when vacancy rates fall, prices start to go up again, and then vacancy rates go up again a little bit. So this is what the uh, uh, office vacancy rates look like. This is industrial properties, and you can see vacancy rates are incredibly low right now for, for industrial space. Uh, and again, these are, and prices are starting to rise a little bit for this space. This is retail. We don't have the, uh, um, the uh, achieved rate here, but you can see, again, vacancy rates went up a lot after the Great Recession. They've come down, and this retail space now is pretty low. It's gone up a little bit, but so are asking rates. So as people start to ask more for their properties, obviously vacancy rates are going to go up a little bit. I've noticed one of the problems in, on State Street, maybe some places in Carpinteria, a lot of these places are vacant because people can afford to be it, have it vacant. That's just a bad thing, right? It makes everybody worse when you see these vacant stores. So we have to sort of figure that out. Um, uh, there's lots of ideas out there, but, you know, we can talk about that later. What's that? Yep, yep. Okay, so anyway, some final thoughts. Um, the economy is trudging forward. Uh, it looks like Santa Barbara County and Ventura and San Luis Obispo kind of are going in different directions. Santa Barbara is not really keeping up. And to me, it's, you know, it has to be because we're doing the wrong thing. It's nothing about any of the disasters, I think, that happened. Um, retail is going to pick up speed. We just have to figure that one out a little bit. It's not going away. I love shopping. A lot of people I talk to love shopping, like to be outside. But again, it's going to have to be an experience. And yes, there's going to be a recession. When? <laughs> Why would you ask me a question like that? Just when I was going good. Yeah, no, look, you know, um, you try to tell people, they, they ask this all the time, you know, the average length of a recovery is maybe seven years or something like that, and we're past that now, and they're like, it's going to happen, isn't it? It's like when people say, you know, the, the, the rains was a once-in-200-year event. And people go like, Phew, it's not going to happen for another 200 years. That's bullshit. <laughs> no, it could happen tomorrow. It could happen 700 years. What it means, it's a rare event. And rare events can just happen all the time. Going back to sort of what um, the mayor was talking about and, and DOS a little bit, when I talked to the public works people, Carpinteria was saved, by the way, because of the riparian corridors worked. There are many things that could have happened in Carpinteria that didn't because they were cleaned out. Um, Montecito, they just lost. They, they went over the borders. and um, So we have to work on the infrastructure if we want to have a safe community. Um, and to me, that's the most important thing right now for getting people back to come to Montecito and, and shop. So anyway, thanks a lot. Um, thanks for coming. <laughs>